Hello and welcome to GD Life at Pals for another GD Science video. Today we will have a look at 10 GD Life Science questions. If these videos are helpful and yeah, help you preparing for your GD Science test, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and ring the bell so you don't miss any new GD Science or in general GD Science content on our channel. So let's get started. Here the first question. A heterotroph is an organism that must consume other organisms to obtain nutrients and energy. Which process can heterotrophs not perform? Mitosis, respiration, fermentation or photosynthesis? So this is an assumed knowledge question, so you have to know a little bit about respiration and photosynthesis. And since we have a heterotroph here, which is an organism that must consume other organisms to obtain energy, this organism will not be able to do photosynthesis, since photosynthesis allows an organism to make its own food and its own energy source. So D is the correct answer here. Heterotrophs cannot perform photosynthesis. Organisms that are able to perform photosynthesis are called autotrophs. Okay, question two. The following flowchart describes the evolutionary processes that scientists believe occurred when a small group of finches from Ecuador migrated to the nearby island in the Galapagos. Connect each evolutionary term on the right to the correct step in the flowchart. So this is a bit of assumed knowledge on um, evolution and the processes that lead to speciation in the end, the formation of new species. And uh, we have a typical list of steps that lead in the end to the formation of a new species. Let's have a look which we call uh, what we call these steps. So first, the island has a limited supply of the seeds that the finches are used to eat, but has an abundant supply of insects. Finches with slightly narrower beaks are better able to catch insects. Narrow-beaked finches begin to have a survival advantage over broad-beaked finches. That leads to the next step. In each new generation, the proportion of narrow-beaked finches increases. Eventually, the island's entire finch population has narrow beaks. And as the island finch population acquires unique adaptations, it eventually becomes a new species distinct from the finches in Ecuador. So let's have a look at the terms on the right and list or assign them to the correct steps. So the first one, island has limited supply of the seeds that the finches are used to eat. That is a selection pressure. Now we have a limited resource for our finches and uh, they will basically fight for these resources. So we have a selection pressure here. Finches with slightly narrower beaks are better able to catch insects. Now we have few finches that have narrower beaks. They can catch insects. They have a survival advantage because they have a lot more food available than the broad beaked finches. That is natural selection. Now we have two types of finches, one with narrow beaks, one with broad beaked, uh, one a broad beaked finch. One is better adapted to its environment, so nature will basically select the better adapted organism over the worse adapted organism. In each new generation, the pro proportion of narrow beaked finches increases. Eventually, the island's entire finch population has narrow beaks. This is uh, adaptation. So number three, adaptation. Um, we have an adaptation once the whole population has changed to narrow beaks and no more broad beaked finches are there. Then the population has adapted a new trait. And after that comes speciation. With these unique adaptations and over many, many, many generations, a new species um, forms, which is distinct from the finches that occur in Ecuador. So the last step is speciation. And these are this is the usual order 
in which uh, evolution occurs. So that's something good to uh, keep in mind. Now we start with selection pressure that leads to natural selection. Um, we will have a new adaptation eventually when a certain new trait uh, becomes more common in the population and uh, yeah, most of the population acquires this trait. We have an adaptation and that in the end can lead to the formation of a new species called speciation. Okay, question three is based on the following table. Guinea pig inheritance fur color and eye color. We have dominant allele for fur color is dark big F and light small f, recessive allele, eye color black dominant allele E, red small uh, E for the recessive allele. How many different combinations of alleles would produce a guinea pig with dark fur and red eyes. Okay, so let's have a look at this. We have dark fur and red eyes. Since the guinea pig has red eyes, which is the recessive allele, that means this guinea pig needs an allele combination of two small E's. If there is a capital E, dominant allele present it would have black eyes so we need two small e's the dark fur color can be formed by two allele combinations two big f's or a big end of small f both will lead to dark fur color so we have two possible combinations here big f big f small e small e or big F, small f, small e, small e. So the correct answer here is B. If you want to know more about inheritance and if you, if you struggle to understand uh, how I got to the answer here, if you have trouble understanding the vocabulary, dominant, recessive, and maybe homozygous, heterozygous, things like that, what an allele is, what a gene is, um, there is a screencast on our channel um, on the topic of inheritance and genetics that uh, explains all these terms and the concept behind this. Uh, this is a quite important concept for the GD science test inheritance. So if you're not sure, check out the screencast and the presentation that explains the inheritance topic. So one more time, the correct answer here is B. Okay, question four, five, and six are based on the following passage. Some bacteria and viruses are pathogens that cause disease in humans. The bacterium is composed of a single cell with no nucleus. The virus is composed of DNA encased in a protective protein coat. Both contain enzymes. A bacterium and a virus are shown in the following diagram. So here we see the bacterium and here we see the virus. We were already told a little bit about the differences of bacteria and viruses in the text above. Here we see some more in the depictions. So let's have a look at question four. Which characteristic best explains why most scientists do not consider viruses to be living things? Viruses lack cells. Viruses have no nucleus. Viruses contain no DNA. Viruses can contain enzymes. And what do you think is the correct answer here? So I will tell you the answer. Now, the correct answer here is A. A virus lacks cells. So a virus doesn't have a cell. And um, according to the cell theory, the smallest unit of life, the smallest living thing, uh, has to be at least a single cell. So yeah, here we need to know a little bit about the cell theory. All living things are made of at least one cell. The cells are the basic building blocks of life. Question number five is based on the same information here. 
bacteria, like all cells, use the instructions in DNA to make proteins. Place a circle on the diagram to indicate the cell structure that is responsible for building proteins. Um, do we get some hint in the text for that? In humans, the bacteria must control cells. don't get any hit in the text. So uh, do you know the structure that is responsible for building proteins? This is related to the topic protein synthesis, which involves the processes of transcription and translation. Translation is the process that in the end leads to the final protein. and transcription happens at the DNA. So first we have transcription, which means copying. DNA is copied into a molecule that is called mRNA, the messenger RNA. Um, not the whole DNA is copied, only a specific gene that contains the information for a protein. That small part of the DNA is copied into mRNA. mRNA will go to a ribosome, and the ribosome is able to read the code in the RNA and then produce the correct protein from that code. So the correct answer here would be to circle the ribosome. This is where proteins are built. Question six. Which of the following are the two best methods to reduce the spread of diseases caused by pathogens? Possible answers here are A, sanitation and immunization, immunization and isolation, isolation and antibiotics, antibiotics and sanitation. Okay, that's a tricky one. Um, well, you can think about the correct answer here. The correct answer in this case, um, we have to read the question carefully, reduce the spread of diseases. So how do we prevent a disease being transferred from one organism to another, from one human to another? And the correct answer here is A, sanitation and immunization. Sanitation is a pretty simple process, but very effective, like uh, yeah, washing your hands very often and um, things like that. And immunization is basically um, something like receiving a vaccine. So you won't be able to get or be infected by the pathogen. And that means um, if you are not infected, then it's much less likely that you are able to transfer the pathogen and pass it on and spread it to another uh, person. So um, isolation might be effective as well um, but sanitation is yeah, probably a better choice here um, and antibiotics will only work for bacteria to treat bacteria but uh, won't necessarily prevent the spread again isolation um, you will probably start isolating once you are sick um, but as you probably know, the pathogen is able to spread before you get sick. So just having good sanitation, washing your hands regularly, and eventually being vaccinated, the better will prevent disease from spreading, reduce the spread of a disease. Number seven. Anemia is primarily, primarily a nutrient deficiency. Which nutrient is deficient in a person with anemia and what body system is most affected? So, key term, anemia. That's what we need to know. What is anemia? Anemia is basically uh, not having enough red blood cells due to a lack of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein inside our red blood cells that binds the oxygen 
and allows our red blood cells and the blood to carry the oxygen around the body and bring it to the cells that need oxygen from the lungs to the rest of our body. Hemoglobin inside red blood cells will bind the oxygen where the oxygen concentration in the blood is high at the lungs and release the oxygen in tissues where the oxygen concentration is low. So what um, nutrient deficiency causes anemia, causes not having enough hemoglobin and which body system is most affected. So since um, the transport of oxygen is related uh, to the blood, um, we are probably in the circulatory system. Nervous system would be an option as well here. I would not in exclude because uh, the nervous system is yeah, our brain is most vital and consumes is one of the organs that consumes most oxygen. So these are two options here: lymphatic system and digestive system. We probably can exclude. So it's either A or D based on the body system most affected. Now, which nutrient deficiency leads to anemia? Now, I just said that hemoglobin is a protein, so you might go for A now, but um, that is not so much the case. D is the correct answer, minerals, specifically the mineral iron. Iron, uh, an iron ion, an Fe3+, plus iron ion is located at the center of one of the heme group in the hemoglobin protein. So each hemoglobin protein has four subunits and each of the four subunits has one iron ion at its center. And the iron ion is, eventually, is in the end uh, the crucial part that allows the hemoglobin to bind the oxygen. So for our body to be able to make hemoglobin, we need the mineral iron. So the correct answer here is D. Number eight, which of the following is an example of mutualistic relationship? So here we are, here we are in symbiosis. There are three forms of symbiosis. Uh, symbiosis is a very close relationship between two organisms of different species. Um, there are three forms uh, that this uh, symbiosis can be expressed and work. We have mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. And in mutualism, in a mutualistic relationship, both organisms benefit of the symbiotic relationship. In a commensal relationship, one organism benefits of the relationship, whereas the other organism is not affected. It doesn't have a negative or a positive effect. In a parasitic relationship, an organism has, one of the organisms has a benefit, the parasite, and the other organism in the relationship is harmed, the host. So let's have a look at the possible answers. A, tapeworms living in the intestines of cat, intestinal bacteria that make vitamins B and K, hermit crabs using gastropod shells for shelter, a wisteria vine growing up and over an oak tree. Um, okay, so tapeworms living in the intestines of cat. That is parasitism. Tapeworm benefits, cat is not affected. Same as answer D, a wisteria vine growing up and over an oak tree. Uh, that could be parasitism eventually might be commensalism as well, depends on how much the oak tree is affected, but it's, since it says over an oak tree, the wisteria will probably block sunlight, um, so the oak tree gets less sunlight, so I would classify that as parasitism. Hermit crabs using gastropod shells for shelter, well usually they use the shells of dead uh, gastropods, so the gastropods are not really affected, so we have probably something commensal here. Hermit crab benefits, um, intestinal bacteria that make vitamins B and K, that, well, these are bacteria that live in our gut. We eat and provide these bacteria with the nutrients that they need, um, and the bacteria make vitamins B and K, and our 
intestines absorb these and they are vital for our body. So B is a mutualistic relationships. Bacteria benefit, they live in a safe environment in our gut. They get free food from us whenever we eat something and they make vitamins for us from which we benefit. So B is the correct answer here. Okay, connect each organism with its correct role in the food chain. In the GD test, you would have to click and drag those uh, squares or rectangles into the correct position. So, a producer, where do we have a producer here? Which of these five is a plant? You probably guessed correctly, it's the tomato seedling. So, the first box gets the tomato seedling, the producer. Second one, something that eats plants, sparrows, Probably not falcons, probably not either wolf spider or crickets. I would go for crickets. Crickets are similar to grasshoppers and they probably eat the tomato seedlings. So crickets, primary consumers. Another smaller organism is the wolf spider. The wolf spider probably hunting crickets. And then we have two more birds, sparrows and falcons. Sparrows are much smaller. They eat insects like wolf spiders, so the sparrow would be the tertiary consumer, and falcons eventually hunt sparrows, and the falcons are the quaternary consumers. So one more time, we have tomato seedling, cricket, wolf spider, sparrow, falcon. And I think this is the last question for today. Which of the following factors would not affect the size of a deer population? The number of fawns born in the spring, the number of new deer joining the herd, the number of male deer hunted and killed, the number of ju juvenile female deer in the herd. Juvenile are young female deer that are not yet ready to breed. Fawns are the newborns. So which of these does not affect the population size? Which of these does not change the population size? So we have newborns. Newborns causes the population size to go up. So A is not the correct answer. New deer joining the herd. This is what we call immigration and that will increase the population size as well. So B is not the answer we are looking for. The number of male deer hunted and killed, that means some deer die, which reduces or decreases the population size. So it's not C. The number of juvenile female deer in the herd. Yes, they are in the herd. They were there before. That doesn't change the population size. So the correct answer is D. Now, in general, population size and factors that affect the size of the population are birth rate and immigration rate, which causes a population to grow. And on the contrary, we have the death rate and emigration rate. So organisms are dying and leaving the population, joining another population that causes the population to decrease. Birth rate and immigration, on the contrary, death rate and emigration. All right, that was it. 10 life science questions related to the GED test. I hope, you, I hope you learned something new and this video was helpful to you in preparing for the GED test. One more time, if you liked the video, subscribe to our channel. Um, there will be more coming over the next weeks. And good luck in your preparation for the GED science test. I hope you will pass with the score that you want. Until next time, this was GED Life at Phuket Paths.